Um, welcome to our amazing panel today for International Women's Day. Um, I'm Nama Bindo, and without further ado, it would be really great to introduce all of our panelists. Um, and I think it'll be great to um, have you introduce yourselves. So I'm going to start with uh, Edna. Why don't you go ahead, please? Great. Thank you. What a joy to be here with all of you today. I'm Edna Conway, and I have the privilege of serving as the Chief Security and Risk Officer for Microsoft's intelligent cloud platform, Azure. Wonderful, thank you so much, Edna. Um, Molana Shkenazi, it would be great to hear from you. Thank you, Nama, and I'm so happy and glad to meet you all. I'm Molana Shkenazi, VP Security Engineering, and uh, CISO of JFrog. Great, um, Rinki Sethi. Hi, everyone. Happy International Women's Day today. Um, I am Rinki Sethi. I am the CISO and Vice President of Twitter. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And of course, Liat Khayoun. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you. Uh, I am a VP of Product Management at the Cortex Group in Palo Alto Networks. Great. So we have a variety of super interesting uh, topics to discuss here, but I think um, as usual, it would be really great to actually kick off with uh, a more of a general discussion. Uh, I think we've had a really jam packed year uh, full of events on um, and, and phenomena that occurred on a variety of both technological, methodological and um, overall uh, management um, side level um, and would be really great um, to start off uh, for example with uh, Liat reviewing how do you see um, your security priorities uh, changing in the past year um, and how do you see them changing in 2021 as we move forward I think mostly what we've seen um, is an acceleration of some processes that we've started to see even before COVID started uh, with the move to remote, uh, remote workforce, the move to the cloud, and all of that just, someone hits fast forward and all of that, forced all of us to go and work from home, forced our offices to now become remote, um, and basically expedited all of these processes that we just started seeing. Um, and of course, with all of these, uh, all of these things happening, we now need to make sure that our net networks, our endpoints, our processes are secured in the way that, um, uh, meets those those new uh, requirements, uh, whether if it means, you know, even our SOC are, is now remote, not being able to collaborate, not being in the same room. Um, our users need to be able to access their network from the outside. So all of that kind of happened at once instead of happening gradually, like we've all kind of expected. Absolutely. Um, Molan, it would be really great to get your perspective as well. Following what Liat said, and I totally agree with you, I think that the, there is something changed is that we don't have network uh, anymore. The network is not longer a perimeter. If we used to have like firewalls and then networking, monitoring of uh, and full visibility of what's going on in the network, it, that it just doesn't exist anymore. Everyone from work from home, uh, the user experience become super important you know developers that they need to rapidly change their environment even the laptop becomes something so so important uh, otherwise you you won't be able to work so your entire office is just here with you and it's it's evolving everything's changed and i think uh, the more it became uh, uh, exposed it's something that we really need to take care of so I think a lot of the industry um, has ultimately very quickly, um, or to a certain extent, uh, adapted to these changes. And a lot of that has trickled down to the way um, startups are trying to, to view and innovate around this. And it would be really great actually to hear um, a bit from Rinky. How do you see um, a lot of startups um, trying to address those issues and how does that fit in? Or have you tried to work um, within Twitter uh, with those early stage ventures? 
Yeah, it's been really interesting this past year, uh, just with decentralization, when you think about the shelter in place that happened and just the doors that it's opened um, for folks. And, you know, when COVID first started, in my head, I was thinking that startups and innovation might slow down a little bit because maybe funding might go down. But I saw just quite the opposite happen. I've seen so, they, so there were so many IPOs, there's been so many acquisitions, and there's been so many new startups. Um, and it's been incredible uh, just to kind of see, in some ways, even overwhelming. Um, but I, I see more startups now in the cloud security space, how folks are solving for zero trust and remote access um, in this new COVID environment. Whereas Moran said that there's no more perimeter, you're now looking at how do you uh, rely more on identities and how do you rely more on that user trust. Um, so it's been very interesting. I've been able to um, talk to some really incredible founders. Um, and you know, you're seeing more and more startups looking at and solving problems end to end, you know, not just solving for that niche problem, but how do you maybe think about longer term turning that niche problem into a platform? So it's been very interesting. I wonder if um, the ability to to grow sort of niche problems into platforms, uh, trying to solve for um, companies not being within their enterprise uh, perimeters anymore, are these things that resonate with uh, you as well, Edna? So I think what I've seen is uh, a move to operational resilience. So uh, over time, you know, about about 20 years ago, we started to think about third party um, integrity and supply chains. Although, quite frankly, you can tell who's kept up and who's been behind because anybody who is looking at you with a shocked face because of solar winds um, <laughs> is somebody that you should look at and say, and where have you been for the last 30 years? Right. And, and the reality is there's a recognition now that you need to drive this combination of a comprehensive approach to risk management and resilience with security embedded in it because we're living in a platform economy and the foundations of those platforms are cloud and mobility. So no longer can you say, I think about security. I mean, I have an intriguing title, right? I'm the chief security and risk officer. And I can tell you, um, and I suspect my, my colleagues on this panel will reaffirm, not many security experts speak the language of risk and vice versa. So blending those two together is quite frankly what the startups of the future need to think about because it is without a doubt the expectation of any enterprise, government, or consumer user. You actually hit the nail on the head um, about one question, which I think the entire industry has been wrapping its head around, uh, trying to think forwards. Ultimately, um, how do we deal with uh, third-party risk management better? Of course, uh, ultimately, at the aftermath of solar winds. Um, how do you think uh, a lot of third-party risk management solutions should be reshaping and rethinking their approach to what they're delivering and how we should be addressing those concerns? Are you asking me? Yes. Okay. So I, I think it depends. I mean, you know, how you even define what a third-party risk management solution is? is changing, right? Sometimes you see some that are focused on a fundamental area of business continuity disaster recover, recovery. You'll see some now that are third-party risk that are blending in cyber modules. Um, and I think what you're also seeing is that the solutions often fail to be truly useful in assessing vendor security risk beyond the basic, easily surpassable threshold. So if you asked how, how they could be improved to really meet us where we need to be today, I think that would, that would be a couple of things. So one would be they have to be extensible and customizable without a doubt, right? The, the monolithic theory of here's what I have, here's what you accept, that doesn't work anymore. The second thing is I think you need to start thinking about um, those solutions that allow the incorporation of a variety of open source intelligence feeds. And more importantly, on top of that, so you're getting your open source intelligence feeds, but can I start to add my customized telemetry because so many of us have it. Um, you know, I think of a, a colleague uh, sitting here today who's from, from Twitter, right? 
I mean, they have their own unique telemetry. Microsoft has its own telemetry. When I was at Cisco, we had telemetry. We want to add that into the environment of looking at that third party risk. So one, extensible, customizable. Two, bring in open source feeds, but allow customized telemetry insertion. And then I think, you know, the, the word hybrid is overloaded because everybody thinks about it in the cloud. So shake, shake that definition out for a minute. I think we need to move to hybrid solutions. And what I mean by hybrid is this open source plus private requirements around risk and security. So that you now have a solution that allows your user to actually embrace and envelop a set of not only open source, but international standard requirements, their own customized requirements fed by telemetry and open source intelligence feeds. That is a solution that we're still waiting for. We've been trying to build some of our own with some third parties, but it's a market that I think our, our startup community ought to be embracing given their talent and ingenuity. Rinky, as someone who's also um, identified or used customized as telemetry, um, as per what Edna just mentioned, uh, do you also view this intersection as something which is uh, pertinent to, to viewing third party risk management? I have a little bit of a different point of view on this one, having been on the vendor side before um, and now being on that uh, consumer side, you know, I. Uh, I think what's happened, you know, you do your best with what you can with third party risk programs. A lot of third party risk programs that I've seen are check the box and a requirement that you have to do for compliance. And depending on what kind of funding a company might have for security, it varies how much in depth you can go on the third party security and just managing risk. Um, so one of the things, and, and nobody is, free of a potential breach, right? Everybody, might, any company sure. might be impacted. And um, I think it's really important to look at a few things. One is when I think about my vendor risk posture, I think about what vendors have I decided or what third parties have I, uh, have I decided to partner with? Who are the people there? What's my relationship with? Do I trust that they're gonna fix the issues that they have, that they're also gonna tell me early on that they had issues? How late am I gonna find out in that? Or am I gonna have to find out in the news first? Um, those are a few of the things. I think the other thing is too, knowing that you can de deal with a crisis quickly, one of the things, um, uh, you know, Twitter uh, was not a SolarWinds customer, but being able to quickly figure out which one of our third parties might be using SolarWinds, what's our risk profile, and having a program in place where you can quickly assess that if you are dealing with a crisis, how are you going to go and manage that beyond that? Um, and so not just, you know, I think the upfront third party security risk program is important, but I think these pieces are sometimes overlooked in terms of how are you going to deal with the crisis if it happens? So um, that's kind of, you know, of course we subscribe to telemetry. Of course, we have the relationships with intelligence firms that are going to let us know early on that you know there may be issues coming. So you have preventative um, controls in place, monitoring in place. But I think that relationship, again, you can't stress enough. I talked about startups and founders earlier. Like to me, the people at a company is just, that's the like 99% of it. Um, and so I think that's really important who you're deciding to partner with. And then can you deal with the crisis if it happens at, uh, at the end of the day? So Rink, let me jump in for a minute because I think Rinky said something that's intriguing, which is she just added the human element, Nama. Right? You asked a question about third-party risk management tools, which I talked about, and she pointed out something that's absolutely essential, which is you have to have the human element involved in this because the tool alone will never get you there. So thank you for adding that. And maybe um, just to add on top of what Edna and Rinky said, risk management and risk assessment can only get you so far in terms of what you can understand about the software, about the vendor, about the, um, the, the code you're bringing into your organization that you can't really control or know what's behind. So basically, we should build our products and our security measurements to just assume risk, to assume a bridge, to, you know, to uh, build the relationships and take the vendors we trust the most and then not really trust them as we deploy security capabilities to make sure that any, any odd behavior, um, any anomaly in how, how they do what they do will be also inspected using our security capabilities and our security teams 
um, knowing that the, the third party vendor is usually just the entry point of the attacker to the organization. Um, and even if we're not able to block that entry point from always happening, uh, we should assume a breach, we should make sure that we can then uh, prevent it from from continuing on its own uh, on its malicious target and its malicious um, approach. Absolutely, um, I think the notion of assuming a breach has become very prevalent. I think in the um, in the past couple of years, and I think this has just accelerated the the sort of the seeping in of this notion, um, uh, which is really interesting. And I think. Um, we just talked about something which has become ultimately very topical um, in the past uh, couple of months. Um, I'd like to maybe steer a bit to another topic which has become topical in the past couple of months. Um, uh, this one pointed again at Rinky. So I think um, in the past um, years as a whole, I think Twitter was in a, the intersection of really um, interesting uh, global events and phenomena, uh, not to name the least of which is the US uh, general elections. Um, so it would be really interesting to, to get sort of insight into your security team and see how that has influenced your priorities and how that's basically different than um, other priorities of other CISO co cohorts you have in the industry. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> Like I don't, I could talk about this for days, so I'm going to try to keep it <laughs> succinct. But um, it was really interesting. I joined Twitter during the most interesting time behind a breach before the election, and then something we could not even have anticipated in terms of what happened on January 6th of this year. Um, and I joined Twitter virtually. I haven't met anybody at the company either, um, and. You know, I, again, I've always been of this, you know, prevention and detection matters and you've got to get those pieces right in order to then respond effectively. And coming to Twitter's blown my mind. I think um, you don't realize um, the impact of the, it's just whatever is happening in the news and things change constantly. Twitter's reacting based on that. The attack surface changes for Twitter constantly, depending on how Twitter responds to something on its platform, which is different than any company I've been at. The attack profile and just kind of the surface area around, um, you know, around the threats, it's just, a com it's just totally different. And we have to be ready to respond and we have to be very, very good at the response side of things. Um, and that can sometimes change our priorities, right? Today, it was election security and what we were doing there was prevention. Uh, how do we protect that public conversation? Um, and so I think those are, the how the strength that we have to have around response is just it's a it's different and how much we have to respond is also different in terms of when you look at the other priorities for a company like twitter it's very similar to i think a lot of uh, my peers here um and so it's we had to also deal with decentralization and covid and shelter in place and cloud security and how do we deal with um you know uh th this new perimeter and how do we deal with um you know now folks working from home and so we've had to ha we have a lot of the similar priorities but i think the biggest one that i've realized is um, new priorities come in depending on what that new uh response might be based on what's happening in the news today absolutely um I see now um, it would be great to actually address um, a cool question we got from the audience, as you can see. Um, so I think the really relevant person to answer this would be Moan, um, considering it's in the realm of authentication and identity management, amongst others. The question goes as follows. I'd love to hear the, from the amazing women in the panel um, about the future of authentication and identity management. Do you think as passwordless um, future is possible? Um, I hope so. Um, Moan is the CISO at JFrog at the intersection of DevSecOps and security. And as such, there's uh, interesting challenges uh, that she faces within this uh, domain. Um, Moan, over to you. Sure, thank you. Thanks, Nama. So, of course, I truly believe in passwordless and I think that will bring us to the next level of identity. Uh, plus the credential thieving and what is identity in general? It's, it's a very good question because the identity today can be uh, SaaS application, it can be not just the human, but API. And uh, as long as we're thinking about identity as a perimeter or something that we can really bring you to, the, to get to the permissions, 
uh, it's something that really needs to evolve and change. Um, I truly believe in passwordless. I'm, uh, I can share that uh, we did an amazing uh, project with taking the user identity and move it forward to one-time password. And even in production environments, they get and bring and grant permissions by your identity. And in general, cloud workloads are all about identity, right? Because what Docker container, what workload is, what is runtime? It's all about something that runs and get this identity and permissions and have uh, and can can live in the cloud. And I think that uh, the more efficient we will understand the identity and how to break those, you know, boundaries. Um, it can be. It's something that should be very uh, invested. Um, I can tell you that when I'm exploring the DevSecOps area, and I'm thinking about how to give uh, services and containers identity, uh, it's something that really uh, bother us and uh, keep our you know busy time to uh, understand how to how to mitigate it. Uh, and it's it's complex because you know, on one hand you really want the business to growth and uh, SaaS application will start to work efficiently. You want a API to API to work intensively and you cannot control it eventually. So the, the way of uh, control it is basically about the identity and permission. So it's user resource and action, of course. And uh, I think the next move will be move to passwordless. And again, like I said before, um, the user experience, especially in COVID days and uh, the work from home becomes super, super important. Even, uh, even as a part of our comparison where, when we're you know, choosing new products, uh, we really want to understand how people react to that because when I'm choosing vendor, I truly want you know the crowd wisdom. I want the developer will like it and want uh, the production will believe in that. Uh, in order to collaborate. So for sure, passwordless is something very important from user experience and also from cybersecurity. I don't want password in the world, I want identity. I, I guess that's my answer. Yeah, and actually um, I loved, I think one of your last threads there pertaining to collaboration within teams that are actually outside of security with security itself. Um, I wonder how that comes to the fore um, within uh, jfrog and how you manage to sort of um, um to get that buy-in from other teams well i think uh, basically that's the that's the secret sauce collaboration and technology right uh i i've, I've never met a CISO or a security evangelist that actually uh did something without both collaboration and technology. And uh, in order to collaborate, uh, you need great technology with you and vice versa. Uh, with great technology, it's great, but without collaboration and without process in place, you cannot gain anything. Uh, so those two boundaries from my perspective are super important. And uh, it's in JFrog that that was the start of, of, the, of the success of the cybersecurity in, in the company is first listen, understand and appreciate your colleagues. Um, understand that in their arena, they know better than you. Um, understand that, uh, listen to what they have to say, uh, adopt their processes, especially in engineering, in R&D um, and DevOps. It's a, it's a new world. DevOps, DevOps become the king of the cloud, I call it. And in order to gain the cloud as well, you need to collaborate, you need to listen to them, um, gather them with you and uh, make them be a fan of security. And I can share with you that uh, the secret of our success is collaboration, great collaboration. With that, we can do great products, uh, adopt great products and startups and, and gain uh, fantastic projects, but it's, it's both ways.
Absolutely. I think um, leading on from uh, the previous point to authentication, I now see that we have a question regarding RBAC, so role-based access control. Um, do you think the current RBAC provided by cloud vendors are not enough? Um, it would be great, Edna, if you could answer that. So I think, look, role-based access control continues to be a, a challenge. And I think the reason for that is something that if you go back to what we heard about the demand that and the changes that Twitter is seeing, which role at what time needs what access, it's the reason why passwordless has to happen. It's not just it will happen. We will fail if we don't. Um, I think we continue to try and think about that, particularly in the context of um, of third parties, right? And you know, you heard Maron talk about the fundamental element that we all need to remember, which is human collaboration in addition to the technology collaborating. And that collaboration can only happen if you are flexible in role-based access controls. I've been thinking about ways to do that, believe it or not, at the hardware level embedded in the integrated circuits. But just, just look at it from a third party perspective, right? And let's assume you're lucky enough to have role-based access control configured for your own environment, whatever that may be. We've just been talking about the fact that there's no perimeter. So you want operational resilience, which I believe now lives at the edge, and the edge is everybody's house and a whole host of other places, including, for me, integrated factories and integrated data centers and enabled connected data centers. Now just think about that third party. When you involve that third party, right, you buy a variety of roles and you may not manage the infrastructure and allocation of identity that is given to that third party by the enterprise for whom they work. So how do you do role-based access control in a collaborative way is where I'm going. What do I wanna say are the, the mainstays of that? And I, I like to think that cloud is the platform that will enable, enable us to do that. I mean, you know, we buy those third parties threats are including around their careless workers, their disgruntled employees, not even ours, right? They're malicious insiders. And we spent a lot of time thinking at Azure about the fact that quite frankly, we also buy to some degree our customers' adversaries. Our customers bring their adversaries with them into our environment. Now start to think about that role-based access control. So you heard identity is the path to the future. It is the number one risk that we need to think about it, but we need to be thinking about it in the context of the world we live in. We don't live in a world where there's them and us anymore. There's only we. And you had best be thinking about role-based access control for the world of we. I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, hopefully it was a way to say, no, it's never enough. That's the short <laughs> answer. I think we're doing amazing things, but I think anybody on this panel should be nodding saying, if you put me under oath and say, do you have the world-class best, unhackable, perfect role-based access control? The answer is always no, because there are humans behind it. And the solution to security is humans. And the problem with security is humans. Um, that's so true. And I think um, someone whose perspective would be actually really interesting to hear about in this context would actually be Liat, um, as someone who's um, working in a team that's a, or basically innovating around XDR. Um, what do you think about both the human element and as well as, you know, how this component has innovated and um, is bound to challenge the way we perceive things in the upcoming years? So I think um, what we've seen so far is that, and, and I also see a question about quantum computing and I can't not um, kind of also see that. Yeah, no, so I, I, I'm, I, I, I'll be naive to assume that I, uh, I, that I can say whether or not quantum computing will change everything or not. Uh, but we're seeing that there's, you know, this um, uh, set of tools that keeps getting better and better and it gets better both for us as the protectors and also for, for the hackers, for the attackers trying to create new attacks. Um, and we need to make sure that we are leveraging these tools, whether if it's machine learning and AI, whether if it's uh, quantum computing, uh, to make sure that we enable more security capabilities. 
Uh, it doesn't mean that the human element can be, can be completely removed out of the equation. For a lot of the more difficult problems, it's more um, ML assisted and for others, it's more human assisted um, and vice versa. So it's, it's not one over the other, uh, but rather where can we make the better, the best progress with a specific set of uh, tools rather than, than the other, trying to go through a lot of data and find that needle in the haystack is something that a computer is more equipped to do, um, trying to figure out whether it's uh, Moran logging into a computer uh, and not someone else might be a, a problem that is still a bit difficult for the, the technology we have right now. Um, so I think it's really about the innovation that we're trying to bring um, is really about how we can use the technology that is now at hand and that keeps on changing uh, to solve to, to solve the problems or the new problems we're seeing and to solve them better um, every time. Adding to that uh, new parameter in the cloud, we've got cloud interior in the cloud, which is the Kubernetes. We have different RBAC. So if we thought that we gained the SaaS application uh, and we can control their workload, mm -hmm. thankfully. So if we did all that, now there is the Kubernetes manage and this is something different. And you also need to gain control to that and understand how people can access to the workload themselves. And it's different, um, which is also a new area to, to, to explore and understand how to do it right. Uh, you need visibility and you need control because this is the new, the new you know, production environment. That's the new SaaS. So yeah. let me, um, because you know, I'm, I'm apt to jump in anyway. Let, no, me, okay. let, me, let me just think out loud for a minute because I'd love to hear um, some thoughts on, you know, uh, as I thought about who might be attending this and interests of startups in, in this environment, I wanted to talk about, and um, like Liat, uh, you, you know, you can't put quantum anywhere on a piece of paper without all of us, you know, sort of going <laughs> into some kind of um, overjoyed thought process. Let's put it that way, because it's happiness, right? But I think um, there are a couple of areas that we still need help with. Clearly, we all just heard identity. Identity is, at the end of the day, where it all lives, right? But provenance is also important. And how you deal with provenance in this kind of an integrated environment is something that I believe there's an opportunity for innovation in. You know I'm wedded always on security embedded at the silicon level. Um, I'm seeing some unique uh, public-private partnerships on that as well, where we're seeing government-sponsored uh, projects to look at things like um, rapid assured microelectronics, but using advanced commercial capabilities, right? Um, I think we should expect that we're going to do more around binary and, and ternary and quaternary semiconductor alloy compounds. Don't forget at the end of the day, you know, sometimes people see cyber as if it lives without the physical, the operational and the behavioral. It doesn't. You need the physical there with you, right? And then last, I'd love to hear my colleagues' thoughts um, on if the audience and the audience might have uh, a desire to hear more on it. There's a war right now between the physical and the topological qubit. If we could unleash the, the logic power behind a topological qubit, we could bring the promise of quantum to fruition, I would argue, not only more swiftly, but more efficiently. Um, there's a debate on whether we'll achieve that goal, but if you go with one logical qubit, you're looking at 10 to maybe 100 physical qubits. If you are thinking about traditional physical qubits, you're looking at 1,000 to 20,000 for those other approaches, right? So part of our innovation needs to be how do we bring that capability in an operational efficient manner? Uh, to the world. I'd love to to get more startups focused on, it's a hard problem. There's a lot of academia still, still looking at it, but boy, if we could do test cases, um, and there are a number of us doing that in, you know, uh, private previews and some public previews to see if we can pull it off, that would help us tremendously, even with down the road operational anomaly detection speed. Sorry, <laughs> I had to do it. 
I understood. When you got it, you got it. Um, it would be really great um, if any of you would like to respond. Um, if not, we do have to be very um, sort of uh, conscious of the time because um, we do have a set of uh, additional questions. And I think Edna would be really great to um, to revert to that question as soon as uh, also this panel actually ends um, together with our participants um, and other mediums. But we'll, we can definitely uh, revert back to that. So ultimately, today is International Women's Day. And uh, I think all of us here um, have um, interesting and uh, very inspirational narratives of our own. Um, and it would be really great, um, I think, to start off um, with a question, the notion of whether when we look at the cybersecurity um, industry as a whole, um, is there a industry specific sort of challenge um, for women or, or a different approach for women when it comes to sort of the realm that we live in? Um, Rinki, it would be great if you um, could give your perspectives. 100%. Um, I just recently tweeted about this. Um, and, you know, it bothers me that we have an issue, forget about women in um, the industry, which is definitely we can talk about that too. But um, my daughter, she's in uh, seventh, seventh grade right now, and she wanted to sign up for a tech innovation class as an elective. And I was super excited. I took some influencing because she had a lot of options and I was like, this is really cool. You should go and sign up for this. She signed up for it. She didn't get in. And it's now fast forward. Her, so she's almost done with seventh grade in a few months. I asked her like, just out of curiosity, I was thinking about it the other day and I'm like, how many boys and girls are in your class and in, in that class that you weren't accepted into? And she said, let me go find out. She asked a kid that she knew was in that class. There were 18 boys and nine girls. And so then I went and sat down with the principal to ask him like, why are we turning down girls if that's what the ratio looks like? And I understand you're, we might be trying to be fair because there's still not enough applicants uh, that are girls. And you know, I think there's so many challenges still in getting girls more interested into technology and cybersecurity um, and innovating in this space and just innovating in uh, general. I think there's that's a problem we need to solve. And I can't even stress it that junior high and that sixth, seventh, eighth grade is when girls are really starting to define what they're interested in. We've got to fix the problem at that at that level, um, and so I think that's one big one. And so I think when you now think about cybersecurity, there's still very few of us. I think the last percentage I read was somewhere between 11 and 20 percent. And when I think about like the challenges that we need to solve as an industry, um, we still have, we need more women to enter this field. And that's what I see as the biggest problem. I think is how do we get more women. Um, how do we get more girls interested? Um, and so, you know, there's a lot you can do in trying to inspire the next generation of women, con you know, and uh, trying to get folks from different fields to get that thought diversity into cybersecurity. Um, but I think that's only going to make incremental change if we can't focus on this from, you know, a younger age. So I, I definitely agree that there's a, that most of the problem we're seeing is kind of at the, the top of, of the pipeline, how many girls, how many women choose to go into computer science, choose to go to cybersecurity, choose to go into STEM to begin with. That's definitely an area of focus. Uh, but I don't want this area of focus to um, kind of relieve us of the responsibility of making sure that the women that are interested in cybersecurity that want to come and, and work in the um, in the computer science uh, area in general, not just cyber, are, are not being invited into it where possible and are not seeing the right ro role models. So I don't want, you know, um, Rinky's uh, seventh grader to, to be able to join the workforce as a cyber sec security specialist in 10 years, I'm hoping I'm doing the calculations right, and then have very little, very few role models to be able to look at. So we kind of need to focus on, on these two areas of both encouraging more girls to go into STEM and then making sure that the women that do come, come our way are welcomed with open, open hands and are, are staying in, you know, within the, the tech world, which is also a big problem. Totally agree. I think, uh, I think it's evolving. Uh, it's something, first, we're in a better place. Okay. I, I started my career 22 years back when I was the only woman in the room. And I think now there are a couple of women in the room. So I'm looking on the bright side of it and, and just uh, and appreciate that. And the more I totally agree, agree with 
both Rinky and Liat, uh, the problem still exists, but we need to pay attention to that beyond the front. And I think that's one of the reasons that I'm usually behind the camera and I open mine today is just to, to bring it to, to the attention of young ladies that really want to enter in and see, uh, have inspired by women that they uh, doing it and uh, be kind and welcome others to join that. Uh, be patient to that, understand, you know, how complex it is to be a woman in the industry, uh, be sensitive to that, and, and open the door for them to enter in. I'm always trying, uh, in my role, uh, to have balance, to have additional girls in the room. I'm paying attention to that. It's super important to me, and I think it should be uh, so also important for, for the guys in that lead in the cybersecurity area. And uh, the one tip that I can give to younger ladies around it is just pay attention to that. You chose the place that you will see women in the leadership. This is something that always was important to me. And when I select my new, you know, new opportunities, and I think that this is something that uh, will really make the noise and uh, make the change. So let me let me jump in. I think as you know, I'm coming up on 40 years in industry, and um, I think you have to attack it from both ends. And and so I spend my time. Um, I agree with everything I've heard. I spend my time actually with um, eight to 10 year olds uh, because I think you need to get them earlier. I need, think you need to get them before hormones kick in, quite frankly. And if it's in your blood, it's in your blood, right? I mean, if, if you see a, a young girl playing with an erector set, um, immediately think there's a mechanical engineer in the making as opposed to what is she doing with the erector set, right? And I, and I recognize I'm a different generation than most of the panelists here. However, I also think we have an obligation to open our minds to the existing members of the workforce who are sociologists, who are economic uh, experts, who are um, folks who can think about risk maybe even an actuarial, folks who have different talents and bring them into the fold because we will not meet our needs if we do not take today's workforce, particularly workforce that if you look at society, may be in a field that is actually dwindling and embrace the capabilities that they have. And I, I would like to encourage us to start things like we saw in, uh, for anybody who's a student of, uh, Renaissance uh, times, the feudal systems actually had jury crafts people. And you took someone in and you taught them real time. You didn't look at them and say, I expect you to be Michelangelo today. Right. You gave them tools and you gave them techniques and you partnered them with somebody and said, let me show you what's going on. And a good craftsperson um, under the right mentor or tutor, the tutor will see this person has an aptitude for that. You can't force fit it. And some of the best women that I know in this field have degrees in, um, I not that I put myself in the best category, but my undergraduate degree is in medieval and Renaissance literature. And I went to law school and I'm talking to you about the war between topological and physical qubits. Guess what? We can learn. OK, I totally um, agree with you. And so it's it's beholden on us. And I think so many of us are at the stage in our careers where we get great joy from doing that with both the young ones, as well as our sisters who are in industry around us and bring us together and look at some of the cybersecurity groups. There are more than 50 of them around the world for women start to attract those who may not have degrees in certain fields, but have skills that are highly valuable. So Edna, you just gave us a perspective um, of how you see sort of the change or, or your insight from the past 40 years that you've been in the industry. Um, but uh, I think all of us here have also seen, I think an industry shift in the past year where you know all of us have um, disseminated to a remote workforce um, and you know the ensuing implications of what COVID actually means. And ultimately this had effect on the female workforce as a whole and, and the cybersecurity female workforce in particular. 
Um, and I would like to ask um, Rinky, um, how did this come to the fore when it came um, as, as you see it? Um, and how do you see this sort of um, emerging or taking shape in the upcoming years? Yeah, I'm, I, I feel really fortunate that I came to a company that was already um, thinking about decentralization before COVID even happened. Um, and so Twitter was already a role model in terms of just thinking about if we're going to serve the global conversation, how are we going to do that if we don't have a workforce that embodies our customer base? And so they had already started thinking about that. So they had a lot of the structure that you need in place to be able to do that because it's not easy to go, it, you know, you don't just flip a switch and say, I'm going to go hire a person in a country where you don't have operations. There's a lot of work that needs to go into that. So we already had the structure in place. Um, and that's opened like incredible doors for us in terms of being able to now tap the world <laughs> to go and hire the best talent. And um, we are seeing there's some amazing women out there um, that we're Grounds. Um, we've also signed, you know, uh, we've challenged ourselves that uh, too. like, you know, we should, Twitter just signed an agreement with Share the Mic and Cyber, um, which is how do we not participate in panels? We, you know, not host panels where there might be, uh, there was not representation from the black community, the Latinx community and women. And so we're starting to turn down things like that to make sure that, you know, you can't see, you can't be what you can't, uh, what you can't see. You know, we heard that again and again, we heard it from Meghan Markle last night during the interview with Oprah. Um, and I think that's such an important fact that we have to, even as women go back and look at um, panels and things like that, make sure that there's really solid representation because otherwise you're right there weeding off girls, women that uh, we, we're weeding folks out that may say that I don't see myself in this. And so I'm just not interested. And I think uh, now it's just with the shift in uh, the shelter in place, I think it's open doors. It's also given a lot of flexibility to women who might not have been able to work because they're mothers and they can't afford, you know, they want to stay home with their kids and uh, just childcare, or even fathers for that matter, who want to stay home. And I think that's a really interesting thing too, where you now have the possibility of being home and being around and still being able to work uh, to the extent that you can. And I think um, it's I think it's helped us progress as a world in uh, very meaningful ways. Absolutely. Um, I'm wondering, Liat, if you also have um, an angle about this. Um, so I, I agree with everything Rinky said about, you know, um, the uh, pandemic opening it up to to us being more flexible, flexible with our time, flexible with uh, where people are located. Uh, definitely, you know, even I had a friend telling me that she could attend more webinars now because they're remote, she could listen in and she couldn't have gone before because it's always like bedtime um, where she she wanted to be around. So that's that's all amazing. Uh, but I think what what it also emphasized is that um, equality leads to more equality. And uh, what I mean by that is um, there were a lot of, you know, at least in Israel, there were a lot of reports about women having to take a step back from their day-to-day -day, uh, jobs and, and what they did to be more, to be home with the kids, to be able to, you know, make sure they're attending their Zoom lessons and all of that. Um, and it was less so for men. So it was kind of a chicken and an egg kind of problem. Uh, women make less money, they bring less into the, the uh, household income, so it's easier for them to take a step back, which means they'll be less considered for the next promotion or the, they, they will fight less to move uh, between their, uh, their, their, their next jobs and to demand for more. And it would mean that they will make less and the next time there's a, a strategy or, or something happening in that house, whether if it's personal or global, um, it again means that they will be the ones taking the step back. And the more equal we are able to be when everything is, is good, the more it allows us to be flexible with the way we divide our time when, when things go wrong, whether if it's a global pandemic or just a personal issue that some that a family might uh, might incur. So so it really kind of emphasized how important it is to be able to have that um, ability, that um, um, capability to 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 shift between those, you know, um, the, the, the partners within the same household without having these considerations in place. Yeah, I think um, 
a lot of that is is pertinent to the industry as a whole, but definitely to a lot of the security uh, professionals, um, which have a lot of, um, I think, uh, distributed workforce related um, challenges, uh, both uh, challenges and opportunities, as uh, we've heard both from Liat and Rinky. Um, and I think conversely, it would be really interesting to hear whether um, in this period of time or as a whole, um, what do you think would be are the best measures or strategies that you've seen industry leaders, whether it's when within your own uh, teams and corporations or um, with your cohort uh, that have been implemented to increase female representation, both in leadership and um, non leadership um, and to promote and encourage women in security teams? Um, Milan, what do you think? OK. First, I'm privileged to be part of such an amazing company that actually 50% of the executives are women, uh, which is quite an amazing. I remember the IPO picture right after the, the celebration. The second picture was only women on stage and it was it was inspired uh, inspiration. And uh, for me, it was it was wow, uh, I'm, I'm honored and privileged to be a part of this leadership. And uh, I am thinking that it's it's basically, maybe intuitively, it's it's one of the reasons I, I chose JFrog uh, as my next phase, uh, because, you know, trying and understand, you know, understand that you want to take a part of that and you appreciate a company that understand the quality of women's in the leadership and uh, a representation that take us to the next level and be very, um, it's something that's really, for me, it's, it was inspiration. And uh, I think a female are, uh, and women in, uh, can bring something else to the picture. Uh, the attitude is different uh, when there are a lot of men in the room and a lot of egos out there. Uh, women can be very deterministic, very determinate, you know, determinate, um, but also bring unique quality and attitude that sometimes make things, you know, quietly done. And uh, I think that's my perspective. And I, I really appreciate the fact that I'm a part of a company that appreciate that and can cherish that and, uh, and embrace it. And also can see more and more women added into the company as leadership and an executive. And this is, it's a, it's a joy and privilege to take a part of it. It's amazing. I wonder if Edna's perspective coming from, you know, a big um, corporation um, and uh, understanding what leadership and, and other likewise um, similar big corporations uh, would be regarding necessary strategy for effective. You know, I think, I've been I've been lucky as well um, to work with two multinationals that are clearly committed to diversity, and not just diversity in gender, but diversity of thought, diversity in color, ethnicity, background, sexual orientation, the beauty of the fabric that makes up this planet we live on, right? Um, and so for me, I'd say there are three things that we, we can do um, that we need to continue to do. And they align with what I've said before. One, teach, get out and teach. Even if all you do is, I did a TED talk a bit ago and I told a bit of a story about, I have, uh, I had at the time uh, a neighbor who had uh, several children and the young lady was about six or seven years old. And I watched her and she, when she got to about 11 or 12. She was really good, really good at, at technology and the way she thought. Um, so we started, you know, doing things in the backyard together and, um, it do, you know, it doesn't have to be a big corporate event. All of us can do something one at a time. You can also at a leadership level sponsor, sponsor a corporate event, right? Like for example, right now, Microsoft is partnering with SANS on Girls Go Cyber Start. And as you know, Go Cyber Start is a large program, but this is one focused just on girls. So teach in any variety of ways that you can, you'd be amazed how much of a difference you can make, even if you do it one person at a time. The second thing is sponsor, sponsor someone. And there is a difference for those of us who grew up never having a sponsor or a mentor. They're two different things, but if you've had to fight and claw for everything you've ever gotten, it changes you. And, um, 
if you sponsor others, you'd be amazed what you can achieve. And if you've had ever the privilege of playing any sport that is a team sport, I rode crew undergrad and in law school, you understand the laws of physics. And, you know, lots of folks say, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go farther, go together. And that's what sponsorship can do. And then last, accept candidates with diverse work and educational backgrounds and bring them into the fold because Ultimately, our community needs to reflect that beautiful mosaic fabric of the capabilities that are out there in the world today. That is um, absolutely amazing three pillars to go by, um, teach, sponsor, and be diverse. Um, I think these pillars are, I think, an overarching theme, uh, which I think all of us are um, dealing with, with both in terms of looking down um, at your teams and the way you want your teams to develop and, and teams that are across from you and your organization as well as in the industry. Um, we, I do have to uh, conclude uh, and say thank you to all of you. Um, I think in the past um, half an hour or so, we, took, we dove into perspectives um, that pertain to the very special day that we're in today um, and regarding how we can sort of increase and, and make the female workforce in the security industry more predominant, um, understand um, how what challenges there are specifically pertaining to the security industries in this way. We talked about how um, the interesting and relevant uh, solutions we can promote both from a bottom down approach and both from uh, bottom up, um, so top down and bottom up approaches. Um, we talked about the ability um, to promote and sponsor and basically mentor um, a lot of these roles. And of course, in the beginning of our session, we talked about security um, opportunities and challenges as a whole, uh, whether it's with respect to um, security industry witnessing challenges across um, not being perimeter based anymore, challenges around authentication and authorization, its implications also around um, the security operations as both attack surfaces increase and um, the complexity of our environments continues to grow. Um, and on this note, I'd love to thank each and every one of you for attending today. Um, super, super grateful to have um, had the honor to share, um, to hear your perspectives here. Um, and um, from the audience, we'd love to keep keep bringing us questions and uh, we'd love to, to get your, um, we'd love to give you feedback on that. Thank you again. Thank mm -hmm. you.